the war of jenkins here is a discrete thing that happened on this side of the globe for very particular reason they raised about four thousand american soldiers from the colony under the english they shipped them down to the caribbean to fight this war these are the first veterans of of a foreign war one of the captains being lawrence washington who was george washington's older brother an excerpt from today's guest it was written about a forgotten war that could have changed the fate of the American Revolution. Best-selling author Robert Gowdy is here, and I'll speak with him after this break. This is Point of the Spirit. Welcome back. I'm Robert Child. Today's guest is a writer, historian, and journalist. His work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Washington Examiner, Harper's, and many other publications. His book is called The War of Jenkins' Ear, The Forgotten Struggle of North and South America, 1739 to 1742. And author Robert Gowdy joins us now. Robert, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It, uh, in reading over the book, I'd never heard of this conflict, but I discovered it was pivotal. To That's keep... what I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want to let you tell the story of the moniker of the war. Why was it named Jenkins' Ear? First, let me say one thing. The reason why you haven't heard of this war is that the British lost big time to the mm. Spaniards, which is like, you know, really hard to do. At least it was in those days. Uh, so um, in any case, uh, uh, moving on. Um, so the, the name of the war, you know, has been um, controversial for a long time. Uh British historians call it the war, of the Anglo-Spanish War of 1732 to 1748, mm -hmm. which is just not a good name for a war, you know. Uh, but um, the name was given by the, the uh, famous historian Carlyle, Thomas Carlyle. Right. Uh, in, in, um, it was in actually just in an offhanded way in a footnote to his multi-volume uh, History of Frederick the Great. And, um, you know, so he was talking about this era and this war, and he says, uh, you know, generally known as the War of Jenkins' Ear, or for, for Jenkins' Ear is what, what he called it. Mm. And so that name stuck. So it was, uh, it was, you know, delivered in a footnote by Carlisle in 1858, 100 years, 120 years later, essentially. Who was Jenkins, and what was the circumstance? So, so Jenkins was a Welsh sea captain um, who uh, got his ear cut off by a, a Spanish um, coast guard, a Cuban coast guard captain, Guarda Costa, they called them. They, that's coast guard in Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, in any case, um, so he, Jenkins was really a symbol for a, for a lot of depredations that were being committed against British seamen and British shipping in the Caribbean. And, and, and in some cases in the Atlantic in those days. What happened was there was the War of Spanish Secession, which, uh, which was a really a massive conflict. Uh, and that took place when the last of the Spanish Habsburgs, uh, Carlos Due, who was the you know, freakish one you read about with the huge jaw, couldn't close his mouth, couldn't you know, have sex, mm -hmm. all this crazy stuff. Uh, Although there's something rather noble about that guy, he suffered so much. You know, he the, the Habsburgs were so inbred right. that it was just, they were at the end they were producing monsters. You know, mm. so so he um, so he dies, and and the question was who would inherit the Spanish throne? He had no offspring, so it was unfortunate for him. But um, so the the choice was, and this is the Spanish Empire, okay. Right. I mean, this is vast colonies in the New World, Spain uh, uh, itself, of course, uh, islands, you know, in the Mediterranean. I mean, we forget Spain had Holland, you know, the, 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 the Spanish Netherlands. So they had they had all this property in Northern Europe. It was this massive octopus, right? Mm -hmm. So right. who would inherit this? Well, he had two nephews. Uh, uh, or a nephew and a, and a grand nephew, or I forget something. One of them was the uh, grandson of Louis the Fourteenth, who was a French Bourbon, who was part Habsburg, and the other was Charles of Austria, who perhaps was a bit, you know, the, Aust the Habsburgs were originally Austrians, 
So the War of Spanish Succession happened over who was going to inherit Spain's empire. And um, uh, it, on one side, you had the partisans of, 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 of uh, Charles of Austria. On the other side, you had the partisans of uh, Philippe, uh, you know, Bourbon, you know, mm -hmm. uh, D'Anjou, I forget the name. And uh, in any case, um, uh, the British under Marlborough sided with the Austrian candidate. The war lasted from 1700 to 1715. It was a massive conflict. Wow. You've heard of the battles, Blenheim, all these other battles. Right. So finally, although the, the French candidate gets installed on the Spanish throne, the British are essentially the victors, and they inherited the dreadful Asiento de Negros, the slave contract, whereby a third party uh, trafficked slaves to the Spanish provinces. Okay, mm -hmm. so th this had been it, would, it had been given to France, you know, when when Philippe, you know, Bourbon became Felipe Cuatro. Or, Mm -hmm. Cinco, I forget, Quattro, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, in any case, um, um, so the Spanish won that part of the War of Spanish Secession that because Carlos II had chosen the French candidate. Okay? okay, but the British really won the war. I mean, I mean the great victories at Blenheim and all the other, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Malplaquet and all these other ba horrible battles. Um, so they get the, as a prize, the Asiento contract, which was really a curse, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So pretty rapidly, the British, uh, well, they created a company called the South Sea Company to administer this contract. So it was a public-private partnership, which is, is always a disaster. Um, and uh, uh, in any case, the, the South Sea Company quickly found they could not make a profit at the slave trade. I mean, it was just, you had to house them, feed them, give them a loincloth. I don't know. It was a terrible thing. You know, many died. You had to treat them medically. I mean, this is valuable cargo in those days. Right. And, and, and the Spanish colonies were sufficiently impecunious that they, they really weren't paying enough, you right. know? So the British, what the Spanish colonies really needed were, was manufactured goods. Okay. And, uh, of course, this is, you know, the very dawn of the Industrial Revolution. You know, the British had all kinds of stuff, you know, linens, you know, iron goods, you know, all the stuff they made in England. And, but the Spanish, the Spanish Empire ran under the mercantile system, which is that you couldn't trade with any company, but any country but the mother country. Oh. So the British turned to smuggling in slave ships. So, so, so the slaves were there as kind of garnish and, uh, and it, beneath the decks, in between the decks, in secret compartments, the slave ships smuggled British manufactured goods. I mean, that's one of the great ironies of this particular conflict, you know. So, in fact, in one absurd case, uh, so, uh, 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 well, so the Spanish Garda Costa would monitor this shipping and they were always on the lookout for smuggling. Slaving was okay but not smuggling like, you know, a shovel, okay? <laughs> so so there's one absurd case where the British, you know, they didn't have any slaves. They had a shipload full of stuff. So they, the captain forced the crew to pin up in blackface. So any passing Spanish vessel would look at the, through their telescope and see these, you know, blackface people on the deck. So it was these kinds of absurd subterfuges. <laughs> now, you know, that the British, so the Spanish, I mean, the British were so good at this as they were good at a lot of cheating, you know, mm -hmm. and um, the Spanish got increasingly pissed off. So the British got the contract in 1715. By seven, by 1732, which is when the War of Jenkins' Ear, uh, 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 well, starts more or less, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, the, the British were flooding the Spanish colonies with goods. So, so the, so the Spaniards commissioned the Garda Costas to, they had the right by, by treaty to stop and search any British ship. Okay. And as we know from our own war of 1812, this leads to trouble. Yes. So the Garda Costas would stop the British ships, look for contraband, 
torture the captains because they often the, the contraband was so well hidden you had to torture you know to find out yeah where the contraband was and so a guy named jenkins who ironically was a, an honest merchantman uh sailing aboard the rebecca i think i can't remember exactly but um so he got stopped by this notorious Garda Costa captain named Don Juan de Fandino. And Don Juan, you know, strung him up a bunch of times from the yard arm, you know, just short of choking him. Right. And he said, look, I don't have anything. You know, and they ransacked the ship. They tore the ship. Couldn't find anything. So finally, Juan de Fandino was so pissed off, he took his sword and cut off Jenkins' ear. Okay. And he threw it back at him. And he said, you know... <clears throat> take this to your king and tell him that if he does any smuggling, I'm going to do the same to him. So, so that is the kind of the, the incident after which the war is named. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Next time, my guest will be author and filmmaker Rick Baer discussing America's ghost army of World War II. We are, in all seriousness, we have been working for quite some time to convince Congress to award uh, the highest honor Congress can bestow, a Congressional Gold Medal, on this unit. And they've done this for other units like the Monuments Man or the WAC, but they've used it in the past to, to honor uh, sort of under-recognized uh, World War II units. That's next time. Thanks for listening to the program. I hope you'll support our guests by clicking on the book purchase link in this episode's description. Each purchase helps support local bookstores, and that's always a good thing. This war was the first one that the uh, colonists, American colonists, became involved with, especially uh, the colony of Georgia. Can you speak to that? I mean, it's it's a very interesting conflict in a lot of ways. Uh, it's completely neglected. Um, and, and a lot of the seeds of the revolution can be found in this in the War of Jenkins' Ear. So what happened was that the British hadn't really been at war for 20-some years, and so they were unprepared. Uh, mm -hmm. And when the War of Jenkins' Ear, you know, start, eventually started in 1730, you know, October 1738 was, I believe, the declaration of war. They didn't have enough troops. They didn't have enough sailors. There had been a an epidemic of... Um, I, I think it was uh, typhus in England mm -hmm. and a really bad winter. So they were like depleted. So they realized that to pursue this war, they had to raise regiments in the colonies. I see. So, so they did that. This is the first time, on, which is what the British called on the establishment, which means they were, they were regular army. They were paid from London. They had, they had equipment from, you know, the army. They, it, I mean, Americans had fought in previous wars you know, under the English, but as militia with their own armaments, et cetera. Right. So, so they raised um, s several, uh, they raised about 4,000 American soldiers from the colonies. They shipped them down to the Caribbean to fight this war. So essentially it's the America's first war, you know, foreign veterans of foreign war. These are the first veterans of, of a foreign war. Among those regiments was the Virginia Regiment, one of the captains being Lawrence Washington, who was George Washington's older brother mm. and, and father figure. The American soldiers were treated horribly. By, the British had nothing but disdain for them. You know, these were not regular soldiers. These were, in many cases, debtors who had volunteer to get out of jail they were you know and also they're used to you know a different kind of fighting right and so the british regulars just these guys are horrible so they treat so the british command treated them the american troops horribly wouldn't give them food wouldn't give them their uniforms wouldn't give them armaments used mm -hmm. them as labor in many cases and mm -hmm. in other cases they were taken and put aboard ship as sailors or Marines, which was not in their contract, you know, yeah. and that was the lowest duty to be a sailor on these stinking hulks that they sailed in those days. Right. Now, Lawrence Washington had the good, and, and I mean, the, the attrition rate was 90% for the wow. Americans, mostly because of disease, mm -hmm. because of um, yellow fever. I see. But Lawrence Washington had the, and good luck of being placed on the ship of Admiral Vernon, who was in charge of the expedition 
to 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 the new world against spain and um admiral vernon kept a very tight ship he scrubbed the decks down with vinegar he made sure all the slops were emptied you know so there was a higher survival rate on his ship i see and and he was a very you know pugnacious but but good sailor admiral and so when lawrence washington gets home he names mount vernon his house in virginia after admiral vernon which is a little known little known fact yeah little known fact so the 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 aim of the british expedition and it was a vast armada was cartagena which is now in um i don't know venezuela or something no colombia it's in one of those countries (laughs) i forget (laughs) In those days, it was the province of New Granada. Okay. So Cartagena, it's still there. It's a big town. So the British thought, and their grand strategy was this. They actually wanted to take South America from Spain. Oh. And they could they could have done it. It was very close. and But there was a lot of incompetence. You know, there was just a lot of dilly-dallying. There was problems with logistics. And there was a particularly bad British commander named Cathcart, named um. Um, his name was Wentworth, okay. and he was very, he was a, a, a school book soldier, you know, and Admiral Vernon had fought in the Caribbean before. There had been a couple of other wars with Spain during his lifetime in the Caribbean, mm-hmm. and he knew that the key was you get in, you get out, or your men start dying like flies. I see. So yeah. he said, we've got six weeks. After six weeks, you're doomed. You know, and Wentworth was this dude, you know, he went by the book and he had to build fortifications to do to attack a Spanish. And I mean, this crazy stuff from Europe, you oh, know, military yeah. technology from Europe. And that's not the way you fought a war, uh, you know, so in the new world. Well, I mentioned Oglethorpe. Paint a picture of him as a commander. So he sought his fortune on the continent. Uh, he fought in the famous siege of Belgrade during the war of Spanish secession when he was 17 years old and um uh he saw his uh fortune in, in the americas but he had a wide humanitarian streak his good friend had died in debtor's prison mm. and and in debtor's prisons it was it's really an absurd institution you know <laughs> you know they would put you in and you have to pay for your room and board in debtor's prison you know when you didn't have money the whole point is that you're a debtor right. and if you ran out of money to pay your room and board, they shoved you in these pestilential dungeons. And so mm. Oglethorpe's good friend, uh, uh, who was an architect and a, and a very cultured guy, authored, authored this famous book called Villa of the Ancients Examined, mm. uh, illustrated, uh, died in one of these pestilential holes because he ran out of money to pay for his room upstairs. This is, you know, it's a great system. I don't know who thought of it, but in any case, so, so Oglethorpe conceived the notion, and it was kind of going around at the time. Others also conceived it that um, there needed to be a place for worthy debtors, quote unquote, worthy debtors to go. Oh. You know, where they could work off their debts, not be in this pestilential environment, and and you know, these are people who just through financial, you know, d- mistakes. These aren't criminals. These are just debtors. You know, right. so. He and some other people, they were the, um, the trustees of Georgia. They, they raised a bunch of money and they sent several boats of, col- of these, you know, they were dead. They were, and by the time the boats got, you know, raised and fitted out, there were only a few, a handful of debtors. But they were, they were religious dissenters, you know, Protestant religious dissenters. Mm-hmm. There were um, a lot of other people. So they went to Georgia to found it as a colony for the betterment of humanity. Oglethorpe in the early days of the war he was eager to you know do some fighting he invaded Florida in 1740 mm. so before the British loss at Cartagena um, he invaded Florida he, he tried to take St. Augustine and that was a disaster he chilly shally he didn't show his usual resolve it is speculated that he was extremely ill oh, that he okay. had he, he may have had malaria okay. and so it was a, a, a British a British disaster also, not as big as the disaster at Cartagena. So they retreat back to Georgia, and the Spanish are like, look, we beat them twice. Let's go get Georgia back. So they land a huge army at St. Simon's Island, which is now a beach resort, I believe. Um, mm-hmm. 
and they're going to advance to Savannah. And their plan, all these grand strategies, is to roll up the British colonies all the way up to like Massachusetts. Like oh, they're going to yeah. take back, you know. So they have these grand strategies that really were I impossible, but they could have taken Georgia very easily because the Georgians were disorganized. They were in league with the South Carolinians, always bad. Watch out for those South Carolinians. Uh, in, in any case, the South Carolinians were slave owners. They, they, they really didn't like the Georgia. They didn't like Oglethorpe at all. He was, you know, abrasive. He wasn't one of these, you know, plantation gentlemen with his slaves and stuff. He didn't drink. I mean, my right. God, you know, <laughs> can you go to Charleston and not drink? I mean, that's nuts. So, uh, <laughs> They were supporting him, but they were very slow giving him the money. You know, he's like, look, the Spanish are going to come and they're going to take Charleston. I mean, they probably would have taken Charleston. They, the Spanish, yeah. were, they sent, I don't know, like in those days, armies were somewhat small. But they sent, for that time and place, a large army, maybe 5,500. Mm -hmm. And there's a debated numbers, but they were ready to do some business. So Oglethorpe had built a fort at Frederica. Fort Frederica, which is still there. They're ruins, I guess. Okay. And he had a, his own personal regiment, which is, they did in those days. It was on the establishment, British regiment, but he it was Oglethorpe's regiment, 42nd foot, I believe. Mm -hmm. So between them, there were some Highlanders with their kilts and their claymores who had settled in Georgia uh, at Darien. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, that's in Georgia, right? Yeah. 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 And um, and there were Indian. Now, Oglethorpe also loved the Indians. The Indians loved him. Mm -hmm. He was there. You know, he just understood them. I see. And he would spend weeks, you know, in their wigwams, you know, with them feasting on succotash and, you know, venison and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> so he had a Yamacra Indian allies, uh, Creek Indian allies, so maybe about a thousand Indians, and his regiment and the and the um, and the Highlanders made up nine hundred. So they have this army, small army against this large Spanish army, and he's going, you know, to Charleston, saying, "Look, you got to help me. I don't have enough guys." And they're like, "Eh, whatever," you know. <laughs> so he goes back. He goes back, and uh, the governor of Saint Augustine, who he had who had previously bested him in the siege of St. Augustine was leading the troops eager to get this Oglethorpe guy. Mm -hmm. And, and Oglethorpe managed to put up a creditable defense and he saved Georgia with oh. like a hand, essentially a handful of guys. And right. yeah. So, so without Oglethorpe, Georgia would now be, I don't know, like New Mexico or something. I mean, it would, I mean, they would have, I think, had they actually taken Charleston and Savannah and all that, and maybe as far north as Virginia, they would have, I think, reestablished some of their hegemony in the Americas. So the history of the, of the continent would have been different. The book is called The War of Jenkins' Ear, The Forgotten Struggle of North and South America, 1739 to 1742. Yeah. Nice to chat with you, Robert, and nice to all meet you. All right, great. Yeah, right. thanks. Nice to meet you. Good, good luck with your book. That's it for this episode. Thanks again for joining me. Next time, my guest will be author and filmmaker Rick Baer discussing America's ghost army of World War II. We are, in all seriousness, we have been working for quite some time to convince Congress to award uh, the highest honor Congress can bestow, a Congressional Gold Medal, on this unit. And they've done this for other units like the Monuments Man or the WAC, but they've used it in the past to, to honor uh, sort of under-recognized uh, World War II units. That's next time. And if you like what you hear, leave a review or a rating or just click the follow button. You can find me on Twitter, at Rob Child, where you can share your comments about the show. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group. I wanted to take a moment to thank our growing army of listener supporter members. You make it possible to continue our mission of bringing you the best military history authors, filmmakers, and movers and shakers. If you're not a member yet, it's easy to join, and it takes just seconds. Scroll down to the bottom of this episode's description 
and click the support link. You'll come to our anchor page, click the support button, complete the brief form. It's that easy. We're planning loyalty perks and giveaways to roll out over the coming months for our early supporters who sign on before the end of the year. So don't wait. Become a member today and thank you for your support.